So one of the things that, you know, we've been really uh, thinking about here in the group is how can we actually um, combine both quantum electrodynamics and correlated electronic structure theory methods to actually predict uh, these, these light matter um, states? How, how can we actually um, do this in a way that is uh, scalable and also in a way that's impactful? That's going to be a bulk of what my talk here uh, will cover. I'll also tell you a little bit about the intersection between the work we're doing in, in um, cavity control and uh, open quantum systems. This is a little bit of a new area that the new intersection, the area itself, of course, has been around for a while that we've been exploring and um, how some of the advances in algorithm design, both classical and uh, quantum algorithms can have an impact on all three of these areas. So QED, electronic structure, as well as um, open quantum system. So I will start by telling you about the uh, reason why we've needed to develop new, new methods in this uh, field of light matter interaction. So this is a theorist view of the world, light on, on one axis, <laughs> matter on another, going from uh, highly analytical to, to computationally uh, fairly expensive methods. So when you start to talk about light matter interactions, uh, one of the, the natural things that comes to mind is maybe let's take techniques from quantum optics, very, very well-developed James Cummings or lattice models that are able to describe such interactions. However, the biggest challenge that, that you might face in, in doing that is that the matter, while the photon is treated very well in these types of theories, Matter is frequently approximated as a two, three, or four level system. So if you're talking about any changes that are introduced by the cavity or by the photon to um, to the material or molecule in, in question, uh, suddenly these, these approaches start to become a little too simplistic. So uh, similarly from um, photonics, from, from quantum optics, you could say, well, maybe I, I could think of these using a transfer matrix method or leverage some of the um, FTTD uh, types, or, or, or if you want to do it in time domain or frequency domain, uh, these types of methods. Um, critical to such descriptions, of course, is for us to have uh, a way of describing our, our matter system using either an effective epsilon or, or chi. And as it happens, that is insufficient to get, get some of the, the observables that are relevant in strong coupling as, as uh, an example. So, so then the other extreme, you say, okay, well, it seems like on, on this side of, of the, the spectrum, uh, the, the photon is treated very well. Maybe I want to look on the matter side of things. I can certainly do that. Um, there are approaches in electronic structure theory that have been around for a while. Some of the experts in this field are in, in the audience uh, here today. Um, but including the photon, particularly the quantized nature of light in these uh, theories is incredibly hard. Uh, so that of course, has led us to think about, you know, how can we best merge these ideas of quantum optics with electronic structure? There's a class of methods, uh, they sit towards the, the top right of, of this uh, uh, quadrant here, and um, they go beyond uh, NEGF methods. Uh, and the idea with these uh, approaches where you formally and computationally combine QED and electronic structure theory is that you have uh, everything you wanna know about the photon, you have the, the uh, quantized nature of, of light, you have uh, the electrons, you're reasonably able to capture some of these correlations. And uh, in, in the next few slides, I'll also show you that you can capture uh, the nuclei as well. So um, much like various electronic structure theory methods, there's a, a set of complexity, a, a, a set of uh, various ways you could go about doing this, and not all of them are appropriate for uh, every situation. So you could think of QED plus um, mean field, QED, and, and Hartree Fock, that gets you a long ways. It actually gets you further than you would get with a Maxwell uh, plus DDDFT type approach. Uh, but it's still, you know, in many cases insufficient. And you can take that further and you can do QED and time dependent destiny function theory or QED couple cluster and, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, that's actually uh, gonna be uh, the, the bulk of my talk today is to tell you how and where we, we've looked at you know, QED plus time dependent density function theory in cases where we've looked at uh, QED and uh, couple cluster and where we think some of these methods are going in, in future. Is there any questions, please uh, feel free to stop me and, and ask. I, I'll endeavor to answer questions as I go along. 
Okay, so our uh, first foray into the system uh, of, of QED electronic structure theory uh, was in, in introducing nuclei uh, to, to the problem. So a couple of reasons to include nuclei here. The biggest one is that some of the observables and some of the debates in the fields were around vibrational strong coupling. So what I mean by that is, you know, there were uh, reports that folks had been able to use a cavity to couple to specific vibrational modes and that this was uh, responsible for the change in the, the chemical dynamics. Now that itself is a very complicated question, but we can simplify that only by first including the nuclei <laughs> into uh, the, the problem. The other reason uh, to include nuclei here, of course, is very natural that uh, we'd be able to get finite temperature effect into our, our calculation. So our physical system on the left uh, looks as so. Hopefully you can see my cursor. We have a, a set of interacting electrons, we have nuclei, and of course we have our all important photons. And a trick that is familiar to many of you, uh, we, we map onto an effective cone sham system with these electrons, nuclei, and, and photons. And as always, uh, this is the, the positive as well as perhaps the downside of using a tensor fan density functional theory approach here, or any density functional theory approach uh, for, for that matter, is that we need a good mean field exchange correlation kernel. And um, in fact, developing such uh, kernels, such uh, functionals for, for these light matter systems is turned into a, a cottage industry of, of its own. And there's been a lot of work in the past few years in actually benchmarking which one of these mean field exchange correlation kernels is actually uh, relevant for, for the light matter system in question. But in our first proof of concept, where we included these nuclei and our first set of calculations, we wanted to look at something embarrassingly simple, which is a CO2 molecule in a regime of uh, ultra strong coupling with a cavity. The one knob that we have in theory that is not available to our experimental colleagues is the ability to turn up the light matter coupling uh, almost arbitrarily, which means that on inhibited by loss uh, or experimental uh, difficulties, we can actually say that this single molecule now gets into a regime of ultra strong coupling with uh, a cavity that is free of loss. And while that's uh, a simplistic uh, assumption, it you know, turns out that we can track using uh, the, the approach that I showed you on the, on the previous slide, uh, a way of um, tracking this uh, strong coupling of, of the cavity to individual uh, modes in the CO2 molecule. We can also, because this molecule now is sitting in the cavity and we have the nuclei, actually model the finite temperature by looking at these uh, finite nuclear velocities, which manifests as this molecule itself spinning in, in the cavity. And that has uh, implications because uh, some of the questions that have come up in the fields are, how does the alignment of this molecule uh, with the cavity, how, you know, if the dipole is misaligned, is it still in a regime of strong coupling? Is it still experiencing an impact from the cavity? or how is, how is the, the molecule behaving in, in the cavity uh, by itself. So we were able to address that uh, using uh, this method, recognizing of course that we arbitrarily cranked up the coupling a fair bit and, and that we had a, a single molecule. But let's make this system a little more complex and say that you know, we wanna be able to look at uh, properties of the excited states. And um, for, for the sake of, of calculation, uh, simplicity, maybe stick with TDDFT for now, We'll go to uh, CTSD here, here in a few slides. So um, the advantage here is that within linear response theory, what we can do is look at uh, various response functions that correspond to this, uh, this molecule that's now uh, coupled to the cavity. Now, what were the questions we were trying to address? One of the biggest ones is, is all of the impact of the cavity on the ground state of the first excited state, or are there actually changes to uh, the entire excited state manifold? And um, of course, Raising that as, as almost a rhetorical question, I'd say that the, the cavity, of course, introduces new potential energy surfaces. It also just introduces some of these uh, uh, crossings that you would not expect in the case of the molecule without the cavity. So that would be, um, you know, uh, one of the, the signatures you could point to and say, this is what the cavity is doing to, to modify the system. All right. So when we think about the response function here, uh, we have a couple of options. One, we can explicitly evolve in time. Uh, that has some limitations, primarily around uh, both the, the memory and how long you can actually propagate in time before the, the problem starts to explode, or you can go to an effective uh, frequency domain and, and think about this in, in the form of a, an eigenvalue equation or a theta equation. So in, in thinking about this response function, the corresponding uh, decimal equations are as so. 
Um, what I want to draw your attention to are the two exchange correlation uh, kernels that now has to be approximated. This is in contrast with uh, typically where you'd only have one of these. Uh, we now have a, a pair of these that actually need to be um, uh, approximated. One that corresponds to the photon electron or photon matter coupling, and one that corresponds to the Stanford um, electronic uh, problem here. So going to a frequency domain, uh, invoking this uh, the theta equation, we actually end up with two blocks of, of this problem. So we, we have the matter block, and then of course we have the electron photon coupling uh, blocks that, that need to, to be solved. So we've been able to now demonstrate this for a fairly modest uh, sets of, of molecules, still not the, the you know, very large uh, uh, and, and many, many molecule scenario that people are interested in. And actually I'm gonna address this question of single molecule versus many molecules strong coupling in, in a, a, a couple of slides. I just wanna point out that you know, in, in this case, we're, we're still looking at a single molecule, but more complex than uh, a simple uh, CO2. Okay, so um, as we, we've developed and these, these methods, a you know, question that, that kept coming up is, you're always going to be limited by these exchange correlation kernels. And that's, um, how do you, is there a way to A, get around it, or um, with a, a theory that is slightly more uh, heuristic, can you actually, um, you know, not have these, these, these approximations invoked. And towards that, this is work that was uh, done by a student who worked with me, uh, Nick Rivera. We introduced a, a way of thinking about modifications to the ground state in a highly non perturbative manner. And in this case, the, the formulation goes as follows. So our system that is our exact system that we want to solve has uh, a very many uh, excitations of our matter and, and our cavity system. And we're left working with this uh, wave function that, of course, is going to be fairly uh, challenging for us to. Yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, uh, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Oh, great. So, uh, could you, uh, I guess this FPXC is adiabatic, means that it's local in time? That's correct, yes. Is there an obvious justification? Um, is there an obvious justification? Um, beyond it being expedient, no, I don't. I don't have a, an obvious justification for that. No. And for the standard TDDFT, those exchange correlation functionals are obtained from essentially the usually the thing that's used is like the ground state ones. But for this uh, photon matter coupling, what kind of XC do you use? Yeah. So there's uh, a set of these that were developed by. Um, the, the group in, in Hamburg, uh, including these optimized effective potentials, um, which, which we found uh, quite, quite helpful, yeah. Okay, if there are no questions on, on that part, I, I'll, I'll resume a discussion of, uh, of, of this approach. So, so this, the motivation behind introducing this approach Right, where it is exactly that, that you know, uh, we would consistently get questions around how we've thought about the uh, exchange correlation. And um, we, we uh, didn't have a rigorous way of, of justifying um, some, of, some of the approximations. But in the theory that I'm presenting now on, on this slide and, and the uh, next few slides, uh, we don't need to invoke such an approximation. And that's one of the advantages. Uh, that doesn't, of course, mean that there aren't other approximations that need to enter uh, this uh, this uh, particular uh, case. So our exact system, of course, is going to be very challenging for us to, to work with, especially as we get to uh, a matter system that is realistic. However, we can approximate it with a few virtual excitations of our effective matter cavity system. And um, we, we do this in, because we can essentially say that this is an onset we introduce and, and essential to actually uh, buying into this is that we have uh, some changes to, to our uh, photonic vacuum that it looks different both with and without um, this light matter coupling. So there's some change that's being introduced. And this is reminiscent of essentially saying that there is some kind of a, a photonic uh, quasi particle. So as we do that, um, it results in giving us this very uh, highly non perturbative ground state. 
uh, which includes these uh, virtual excitations of, of a uh, few levels of this matter cavity system. And um, in order to understand this method a little bit better, the first thing we wanted to do is actually contrast it and benchmark it relative to exact uh, diagonalization. Now, of course, we can do exact diagonalization for a small problem, uh, but it provides a good benchmark. So now we're looking at a cavity with uh, about 50 photon modes, a few um, excitations, and, and we have a small system, so three or four levels. We're not looking at our super complicated molecule. But again, this is for the purpose of benchmarking, not because the method that we've developed doesn't actually extend to um, these, these larger systems. So what I'm showing here now is going from no coupling. This is a case where there is uh, no impact of, of the cavity or, or the photon field on, on our matter, um, going to a regime of really uh, ultra strong coupling. This, is, um, this would be highly unrealistic to, to uh, realize in any of the uh, types of experiments that we're considering. If you're on the left of the slide, you're probably looking at uh, an anaplasmonic or uh, a dielectric cavity. Uh, perhaps here you're looking at some high Q cavities, not necessarily uh, ultra high Q. Uh, somewhere here you're looking at maybe something like a, a superconducting cavity, something that's also cooled down. This would be a fairly uh, uh, hard experiment to do in, in this part of the spectrum. So contrasting three things here, exact numerical diagonalization, which is uh, in uh, these uh, red dots, our method, uh, variational uh, QED. Uh, what I didn't show on the previous slide is how the variational uh, principle enters how, how we go about um, handling the, the ansatz I, I introduced, uh, but, but take my word for it for, for now. Uh, we have this um, approach in, in blue and a standard perturbative theory in these uh, yellow dashes. So what you see is that as long as you're in a regime of, of no or, or some coupling, everything continues to agree, that's good. Uh, but as you get into a regime of, of strong coupling, and especially as you get into a regime of deep strong coupling, you start to see that a perturbative approach actually heads in uh, the, the wrong direction. So this is a, a bit of a problem. Um, and, and in fact, what we see is that our method and exact diagonalization agree across this entire uh, range of couplings. Uh, so put, to, to put that in perspective, you know, usually if you take a, a method from uh, quantum optics, you would not want to go from all you know, from no coupling to all the coupling you can ever have. That's, that's typically, um, you know, it's hard for a single method to actually uh, span that entire uh, range. So, so the fact that we can do that here using our method, um, especially with an approach that is computationally quite inexpensive uh, was, was a, a victory for us. Can I ask another question? Please go ahead. Yeah, and, so, so this, and, since this is tutorial, maybe uh, please allow me to ask uh, some really Absolutely, and it, may I ask for your name? I'm sorry, I can't see you, and I, I can't. I don't want to risk IDing you by by your voice. Oh yeah, no. so so like a 50 photon modes means that sorry, 50 photon modes means that you have a bosonic operator and the bosonic space, uh, the dimension of the uh, bosonic Fox space is uh, two to the 50. Yep. And what does four photonic excitation mean? Right. So, uh, so, so let's. So, if we go back to to the uh, introduced ansatz, right? Uh, we're we're not keeping all of the excitations of our, uh, you know, atom and, and cavity system. We're approximating with a few virtual excitations of it, and that few component is actually uh, key. So, not all of these photon modes, even though you may have a multi-mode cavity, are are involved in the um, in the, the excitations that will be considered in in describing this effective uh, matter cavity system. Okay, um, I'll keep going since uh, I, I don't hear a follow-up, but if there are follow-up questions on this, uh, please go ahead and ask. Okay, so a couple of other things that are in just our method here. Uh, by the way, I encourage you to, to look not only at uh, the, the paper here, but also uh, some follow-up work that's been done by Nick and uh, also some of the work by uh, the group of uh, Ido Kaminer at, at the uh, Technion that has taken some of these non perturbative um, observables and, and taken them in a different direction with electron beam interactions with, with matter that also is uh, reminiscent of, of some of these uh, strongly uh, non perturbative effects. Yeah. 
Okay, but some of the things that are also included, which uh, we've made predictions for, I wasn't planning to talk about these in any uh, detail today. I'm happy to do that in, in uh, various social conversations with you. Uh, we have the, um, um, the spatial dependence of the CASMA folder here that's included, and it's included in a way that is non perturbative which is, uh, to, to the best of uh, our knowledge, not done in other methods. Uh, so you could think of scenarios where you're describing, uh, say, uh, um, an emitter sitting very close to a surface, uh, perhaps where selection rules are broken, and, and uh, there's some spatial component to that problem. Uh, which which you could actually uh, describe using the, the method that I introduced here. Okay, so uh, I want to switch gears a little bit, if there are no questions on, on this, to uh, talk about what I've swept under the rug so far, which is what happens with multiple molecules, what happens with these intermolecular interactions, uh, and how one might be able to actually treat such a problem. This is work that is being led by uh, Dr. John Felbin in, in my group, in collaboration with um, uh, uh, Tor, Ming Chen, and uh, Henrik Koch. So um, there's a, a raging debate in the field as to what is the role of these uh, intermolecular interactions. Is it physical to talk about um, a single molecule in a regime of deep strong coupling, or is that purely a made up problem? And should we, you know, be entirely focused on actually describing such intermolecular interactions that are impacted by cavity. And so uh, towards that, uh, we've, we've uh, been working on it. What I'm gonna present on the next few slides is unpublished work. And um, I, I hope that it can be uh, treated as such. And I'd love to get feedback from, from folks here in the audience on you know, where uh, perhaps other methods in the field might help us out. So there's, there are various reasons to look at intermolecular interactions that are not just that there's a raging debate in the field, by the way. There's also very, uh, very much this aspect of, of uh, phase transition. So could you perhaps use the cavity to drive through phase transitions? Ironically, this has already been uh, done and thought about quite extensively when you're talking about a cavity coupled to a condensed matter system. So for example, a cavity coupled to a uh, strong shift titanate, STO, that's driving it through a phase transition. Uh, but it turns out to be a harder problem to do uh, for, for uh, such intermolecular uh, types of cases. There are, there are examples in energy transfer and, and others that, that are also equivalently important. So in this case, um, now I'd like to draw your attention to the plot and the right. Uh, so we've used here a further extension of that uh, QED to DFT method. This is now QED and um, uh, FCI. And the reason to do that is because we're now looking at the simplest molecules. So always start with a simple problem, uh, which is hydrogen molecules. There are a handful of them sitting in a cavity. And our expectation was that there would be some modification to uh, the, the uh, scalings. Perhaps there'd be a modification to either the R6 or the R3 scaling that you expect to see in such uh, intermolecular cases and that we could attribute it to the cavity. Okay, that was our uh, expectation. Now, uh, in, in red here is um, the case without a cavity, and, and in, in black here is the case uh, with cavity, and uh, the overlaid fit on top is uh, the, the famous Leonard Jones potential, um, and, and that's just to kind of guide the eye as to, to what we're looking at in terms of these uh, various uh, length scale changes. So the R to the... Uh, uh, six, R to the three, as well as R not uh, terms here actually appear to have some modification that is introduced by the cavity. Uh, the impact of the cavity on, on those three terms appears to be uh, different. So it's not a, uh, a uniform uh, change to all of those three, which, which makes sense. You don't expect the infinite range and the super short range terms to be uh, similarly modified. But what we found interesting is that uh, this is uh, this is the case where, where all three of those experience some impact from uh, the presence of the cavity. Um, and this is a set of few molecules. So now this question of how are the molecules aligned relative to the cavity, what is the dipole moment, uh, and, and ha what happens when some of them are rotated relative to the cavity becomes even more uh, pertinent. And, and that's something that you could visualize, the, the pertinence of that question you could uh, visualize through 
uh, simple uh, probation theory because you see that the alignment of dipole here shows up quite explicitly. Uh, Brene, I, I have a question about this. So, um, so if you, I, I'm trying to understand, right? So, so, so if you uh, do uh, quantum electrodynamics for intermolecular interactions, and in order to get van der Waals interactions, you need to go to force order perturbation theory, right? Because That's right. So, so can you maybe clarify because you say that you use second and third order perturbation? Yeah. So, so this this is a, a maximally confusing slide, but uh, the the calculations here are you know explicitly using QED and and uh, CI. The the perturbation theory aspect here is mostly for us to intuit what's happening and visualize. Um, and the going out to second or third order. I think uh, primarily allows you to think about, you know, what is the role of the dipole moment, not just uh, not the, the, the Van der Waals component. You're absolutely right that you'd have to go to a higher order in order to visualize that. Yeah. Yeah. So the 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 big question here for us is, you know, um, can we uh, think of uh, a way to do this for a large enough number of molecules that we can um, you know, test this hypothesis. Perhaps we can talk about changes to, to various uh, types of uh, liquid to, to solid phase transitions, uh, recognizing that hydrogen is a very um, fraught example for this. But taking a few thousand molecules and doing this high level theory is very, very hard. So this is where uh, Ming Chen's expertise has come into play in actually uh, thinking about these molecular dynamics uh, simulations and, and fitting these uh, intermolecular uh, pair potentials. I am not uh, by any means an expert in MD. So if somebody has a way of doing this that is better than how we're doing it, I'm, I'm all ears because uh, what we'd like to do is you know, have our, our uh, QD couple cluster calculations, um, you know, have something for probation theory for, for intuition, but ultimately in order to get to um, this many, many molecule question to get to have any hope of um, understanding what's happening experimentally or better yet, predicting what's going to happen in experiments that have not been done in these systems, we actually need to uh, merge this somehow with, with MD. And that's something that we're working on uh, quite uh, extensively now. So um, lots of things have been completely swept under the rug in the way we've thought about this problem so far. And in the spirit of this being a, a tutorial, uh, you know, I want to ask some, present some open questions, and and, and certainly get views from uh, distinguished uh, chemists and, and physicists in the audience. You know, how do we think about modifications to chemistry? You know, when I introduced that that method with uh, these non-perturbative uh, observables, I said this this statement that you actually don't need real photons. And uh, to to some of my chemist friends, this question. Uh, is is quite baffling. So how are we modifying reaction rates in a cavity when we're saying that there's a possibility of making this modification without real photons being present? Is that physical? And I don't have a, a good answer to that, but I think that's a, a fun question to ask. Uh, another one is, you know, are we thinking of these uh, reactions as somehow being uh, non-local? Because again, we're talking about a cavity mode that is, um, that's well for the entire cavity. It's not localized to a specific molecule and, and specific part of the cavity where, where the molecule is, is interacting. So um, I think this, uh, you know, brings a lot of uh, different questions all, all at once. So these questions around chemical reactivity, uh, thinking about these electronic interactions, how do we best treat the correlations without um, making our, our problem insanely complex, uh, effects of solvation, something that I haven't talked about at all, uh, and other kinds of collective effects. We're just scratching the surface, I think, uh, some of the, the ideas uh, that, that we've presented so far, thinking about these uh, ensembles of, of um, hydrogen molecules, I think is just the beginning. So there are various other kinds of collective effects that would come into play, especially if we start to look at molecules that are more uh, more interesting than than the uh, hydrogen case. So I I want to um, you know also point out that there there's a, a component that. Uh, we've also swept under the rug that maybe doesn't need to be too complex, which is how do we treat the issue of loss? And uh, this is where rubber hits the road quite literally because there are two 
things that go into to loss in such um, matter cavity system. One of them is the natural one that first comes to mind, which is what happens if my cavity is somehow um, low Q, low quality factor, it's lossy. Uh, of course, in theory, I can crank up the coupling, but in practice, I can't. So that question, it turns out, is relatively straightforward to address. A second, maybe more complex question comes up is what if there are non-Markovian effects or other kinds of uh, dissipative effects where we're starting to see some backflow of, of, of energy in these strongly coupled systems? And this is a case where treating the bath as being uncorrelated from the uh, quantum system seems like a bad approximation because I'm talking about strong coupling this, this whole time. Um, so to address both of these, the, mon the mundane question and the less mundane question, uh, we've made some strides. So towards describing loss in the cavity, we've taken a phenomenological approach. Turns out this is actually sufficient and it can address questions like, how does my, um, how does how, how does this doublet, this feature of strong coupling, this probably splitting change if I have loss in the system and can I overcome it by turning the um, turning up the, the coupling between the, the light matter system? And the answer is very simple. As soon as I have loss, um, this nice doublet is lost. Everything starts to look like a broad signature. Everything starts to, to essentially look like a broad plasmonic peak. And there's nothing you can do about it, even if you uh, somehow um, arbitrarily increase the light matter coupling. And that's a scenario where then you can start to figure out how much of, of what I have is in the electronic states and how much of it uh, is, is located in, in my uh, photon modes. We've done this for, for some simple molecular systems. Turns out that this um, phenomenological approach actually captures uh, things sufficiently. What it doesn't capture is what if I have some kind of hopping or interaction across different uh, surfaces. That's something that we haven't been able to incorporate into to our approach yet, uh, but something that I'd, I'd love to hear about from people during this uh, core program. So um, the component that is harder uh, to incorporate is these explicit non-Markovian effects. And uh, to specialists in the audience, uh, the next uh, few minutes might, might seem a little uh, too pedagogical, but I'll, I'll spend a couple of minutes on this regardless. So there are various ways for us to treat Markovian processes. Um, Markovian processes that are, are within, um, the, the, you can write down a, a master equation here, Lindblad equation. It's not the only way you could go. You could also equivalently do this with, with Redfield. Um, and this is all derived within the uh, Born-Markov approximation. And, and this master equation, of course, has been very successfully applied to a whole host of problems in quantum optics, like harvesting and, and chemistry physics uh, alike. Um, what's not so obvious is how to actually incorporate some of these um, non-Markovian effects and um, thinking about non-Markovian Dynamics, uh, mathematically defining what that is, is uh, a field unto itself. We heuristically think about it as backflow of energy of information from the environment back into the system. And now our mass equation here is the nakajima swanzig instead of uh, the, uh, the, the, the Lindblad equation that I showed in the previous slide. And uh, it looks as though, of course, now you're worrying about this for practical implementation because you don't want to lose complete positivity of the density matrix. Uh, in order to retain complete positivity of the density matrix, there's a method that was introduced by uh, Kay Head Marston, a postdoc who's working with me, soon starting her own group, and uh, David Mazziotti. Uh, it's called the Ensemble of Lindblad Trajectories, ELT for short, which is what I'm going to use for the next, uh, uh, next few minutes. And this method is derived by taking an ensemble average over many different ln Blodian trajectories. And the, the claim to fame with this method is that it allows you to overcome this issue of uh, uh, losing the complete positivity of the density matrix. So you're guaranteed complete positivity of the density matrix, which means uh, you're guaranteed to stay physical uh, in, in uh, this, the process of doing this. And you're doing this by basically taking a bunch of different trajectories. So, uh, we, we show that actually, if you had um, something in the regime of strong coupling, now taking a very simple example, which is the James Cummings model, again, something we can solve exactly. That is the only reason this has been picked. Um, and looking at it both on and off resonance. So on the left, uh, showing a handful of different methods that 
uh, essentially show why it's important for us to have uh, these non-Markovian effects included when you're in a regime of, of strong coupling. So the simple uh, Markovian case is in green here. You see, of course, once you start to lose information, it's all gone. Um, there, there are other methods. What uh, strikes me as um, quite exciting is that the ELT method and exact overlay almost, well, no pun intended, exactly throughout this um, set of, uh, uh, throughout this entire uh, decay time. And uh, you can see that um, the ELT method here in red and overlaid with uh, a, a black line, which is the exact uh, approach. What's further exciting about this algorithm and, and from uh, maybe a future work standpoint is that this uh, ELT method for, for non markovian effects can be mapped onto um, a quantum device. There is a quantum algorithm analog of this approach that exists. And um, I suspect it's uh, you know, just, just the beginning of how uh, such a, a exciting complex master equation can be mapped onto a, a quantum computation framework. Uh, what I'm essentially saying is that the James Cummings model isn't the most exciting problem to solve using all of this machinery, but it, um, uh, but the fact that we have a quantum algorithm analog of it uh, presents the, the way to doing more uh, complicated non-Markovian dynamics. And we do this through a combination of dilation decomposition methods for Markovian and uh, the ELT component for, for non-Markovians. Uh, since, since this work uh, first appeared, we now have uh, a couple of other uh, extensions to it that uh, have, have been published. I, I won't get a chance to talk about them in this talk today, but I hope that uh, during this long program, there'll be an opportunity for us to discuss. So my title said not only like matter interactions, but also non-equilibrium dynamics. And I uh, want to spend a little bit of time telling you about how polar times and treating such light matter cases is not limited to uh, a molecule or a few molecules sitting in a cavity. In fact, this idea of uh, cavity control of matter uh, goes beyond that and, and is very general to thinking about various types of flaritons that exist in matter. Uh, uh, poster child. Or can Go I ahead. ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, about the, the non-Markovian uh, stuff. Yeah. Before we leave it behind. Uh, you, can, uh, you can sort of create a, a stochastic Schrodinger equation, a time-dependent stochastic Schrodinger equation whose sort of long time dynamics give you the Lindblad uh, formalism. Did you look into that at all for, you know, looking at these, this ensemble of Lindblad trajectories? Um, so as, as far as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that approach captures any backflow or revivals. Um, the, the approach that you mentioned, but um, maybe maybe there's something that, that I've missed. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about these, these uh, polaritons in various materials and uh, some of the ways that I'm building up towards basically telling you, and I'm gonna give you my punchline because I know I'm gonna lose people uh, here in, in the next few minutes, but um, I'm building up to, to make the case that the cavity control of polaritons, especially when the polaritons are, are in uh, condensed matter, has many analogies to actually explicitly driving the material. Okay, so essentially uh, you can take a non-equilibrium drive and, and accomplish the same things as the cavity is. There are some subtleties in how they're different, but there are also some commonalities. And there are some key differences in how you would treat them from a theory standpoint. Okay, so that, that's what I'm gonna try and convince you of in the next few slides. So when it comes to polaritons, the choices are many. And um, not just limited to plasma polaritons, one out polaritons, or, or excitons. There are also other kinds of uh, polaritons we become interested in, including magnon polaritons, uh, uh, Cooper pair. Uh, there's, uh, there's a long list of these that, that exist. Okay? Um, but one of the things that is, I think, uh, exciting about polaritons that are particularly of the uh, phonon or, or magnon type is that. The cavity approaches to controlling them and the ultra fast approaches to controlling both phonons and magnons have a lot of similarity. And so I'm going to focus on those two types of polaritons for the next uh, a few minutes. Okay. So if you haven't thought about phonon polaritons in the, the past, uh, the idea is as follows in polar materials, it could be HBN, silicon carbide, pick your favorite polar material. I uh, 
um, have uh, in, in the restaurant pan, I have uh, some form of, of splitting uh, between the longitudinal and transverse uh, optical phonon modes. And I use that to then, uh, relative to the light line, create a, a lower and an upper polar branch. Okay. So in itself, this idea is actually quite general. Uh, it becomes a little more complicated when you say, instead of a 3D material, you only have a 2D material, the splitting goes away, but you can still have uh, coupling and excitation of such a lower polariton. So there are three advantages of photon polariton. One, uh, which you might uh, not typically think of, is that it is in the near mid IR now, and losses are not so much of a problem. So it turns out that, that some of the resistive losses or some of the other um, uh, damping terms that dominate in the visible or the UV uh, become less prominent in, in the IR. Uh, another reason to think about such phonon paratons is that now you're using the lattice, essentially, uh, which you can strain and modify other ways to actually couple photons into, into matter. And doing this in a true 2D material essentially means you can have a phonon paraton that's now localized to a, a single layer, and you can um, use the, the fact that you're coupling via the lattice to other order parameters in the material, okay? So uh, we were quite heartened by this report, um, you know, of, of a monolayer of strontium titanate that uh, has phonon uh, that that not, doesn't have phonon protons, that hasn't been shown yet, uh, but it, it exists, it's stable. And we thought that what could be cool here is that strontium titanate has this exceptional uh, phonon. It, it's also got these various phases that exist that uh, people have shown that by driving this exceptional phonon, you can actually move around the phase diagram. So why not creating a phonon polariton and then squeezing that phonon polariton and doing various things to STO via that uh, phonon polariton? Or better yet, if you wanted to make an interface with it of some other, um, say, superconductor or other uh, fancy material where uh, you're modifying the behavior right at the interface or you're creating something that's proximity-induced, uh, there, there are various options. So we started to look at phonon platons of this system, and I don't want to dwell on this too much beyond saying that actually phonon platons in uh, such a, a monolayer of an oxide perovskite are actually very stable. Uh, it takes everything that uh, we, we've developed for conventional phonon platons in the near mid IR all the way out to the terahertz, and you can think of engineering all kinds of interfaces. Think about uh, squeezing the phonon platon, modifying the order parameter that way or even in some cases, twisting uh, some of these perovskites. But we're not gonna have time to talk about all of this today. So I wanna come back to uh, why we actually started looking at phonon platons in this talk to begin with. And uh, that's because there is an opportunity for, for us to couple to this phonon via the cavity and not just stop at the phonon, but go from the phonon to some other order in, in, in the material. So we have one example for this uh, where we, wanted to uh, think about, so, so these phonon platons, these phonon modes, we're thinking about things that are in the terahertz. And the terahertz, the cavities are actually quite forgiving. So unlike the molecular cavities we were looking at, uh, you can think of uh, um, fairly macroscopic patterned uh, cavities. You can think about entire tapes of these. In fact, uh, people can do this uh, quite robustly. And the type of material where we wanna actually see uh, such, such a phonon mode coupling through the cavity now is going to be more exotic, a cuprate uh, parent compound, in our case, uh, YBCO. What we're gonna try and do is go via the cavity, couple to the, the phonon, and via the phonon, then talk to the magnons in the system. And the reason for doing that in a cuprate uh, parent compound, especially is because uh, the antiferromagnetic uh, fluctuations in the system are, are believed to be uh, responsible for the pairing glue. So now you might have a way of going via the cavity, via the phonon, to the magnon, controlling the superconducting condensate. And it, it seems a few, few uh, degrees removed, but actually it turns out to not be such a crazy idea. Okay, so now using a figure describing exactly what I did with, with my hands, uh, this, this phonon mode now corresponds to this uh, C-axis um, uh, oxygen mode. It's a very well-known, well-characterized phonon that exists in uh, YBCO. Our cavity now, once it couples to the phonon, uh, it can talk to uh, the, the magnons in the system. And uh, now again, there is a choice. In a monolayer of YBCO, we are talking to uh, the, we need the spin orbit coupling. We're talking to uh, the, the lowest order magnon. The absence of spin orbit, 
you'd need to be in a, a bilayer or many layer case where now you're talking to a, a bimagnon operator. But ultimately, the result is the same. You're using the cavity to modify uh, the order parameter. And this is almost exactly what you would do if you were looking at any of the ultra-fast uh, control of uh, such, uh, such, such compounds. So uh, this is now the jump where I'm going to try and, and say that you know, this cavity control of, of magnons, cavity control of going via the phonons, is exactly equivalent to, um, not exactly, but, but it's mostly equivalent to if you were driving the system using a, a giant laser. Okay. So in that case now, right, so if you, if you break it down, I have um, either an approach to couple via the electric field component, or I can couple via the, uh, uh, the magnetic field directly to uh, my system. Okay. Um, and if I'm going via the electric field, I'm going to talk to some IR active phonon mode. And then I, I'm going to use that to, to modify something else in uh, my, my uh, system. In this case, the simplistic system we'll look at is cobalt fluoride. Uh, people, uh, folks like Andrei Cavallari have also done this a type of uh, uh, phonon-mediated uh, modification of matter for various types of, of superconductors. Or I could think about this, magnet, uh, this magnetic field now coupling to uh, the, the magnets directly, and I have uh, again, access to the, the same uh, type of condensate. Um, so what I want to point out, and this is uh, hopefully something that, that there'll be more opportunity to discuss in, in the various workshops, um, I think there's a, a dearth of methods to uh, treat such systems explicitly. Much like in the cavity case, uh, we were now, we're now talking about a system that is actually uh, quite far from, from equilibrium. And it doesn't just have to be you know, in the visible or near IR or in the terahertz. In fact, the set of techniques that people are using to, to strongly drive the system and couple to the order parameter dynamic is, is vast. Uh, there are XL techniques. Uh, there are techniques all the way actually in, in the microwave that have uh, uh, accomplished something similar, where you can think about a microwave resonator that is now coupling to uh, the order parameter. And uh, in such scenarios, uh, certainly TDFT is insufficient. Uh, there have been attempts to um, use modifications of dynamical mean field theory uh, to, to describe such systems, your, your challenges there as well. Uh, and so the biggest challenges that I see are, you know, how do you, how do you describe this explicit coupling to say the phonon or to a collective excitation like a magnon and then, um, then propagate that all the way to, to uh, changes that occur in the condensate. Um, so to put that, uh, put, put a little more, more uh, color on, on that, I'd say, you know, uh, in terms of uh, looking at it in, in potential energy surfaces, you know, when you're probing, maybe your electronic or lattice coordinate is wobbling around uh, the, the bottom here. But when you're thinking of actually uh, switching or driving critical phenomena, now you're you're not just talking about something that is is wobbling around the, the minimum here. These are various non-thermal pathways that are triggered by excitation. So I, I uh, caution you against, uh, you know, thinking that this is just a thermal effect or something that can be described as a, a perturbation on uh, some of the, the ground state uh, effects that also exist in, in these systems and, and are exciting. In fact, in this case, we, we really ought to be uh, talking about you know, how, how this uh, energy landscape is, is fundamentally modified by uh, external excitations. Same way that in the cavity case, we were talking about how uh, the potential energy surfaces are modified. I think we need to uh, develop a, a similar framework in, in this context. Um, so I, uh, you know, this is certainly a, a big open problem. We haven't solved it. Um, and, and various people are, are uh, working on uh, making this happen. But I just want to uh, give you some, some take homes from uh, the last hour or, or so of my talk, which is that, you know, we, we started by looking at cases where, uh, you know, we were describing um, Light matter coupling, we're talking about a molecule um, coupled to a cavity. Uh, we talked about you know, various uh, approaches in Abinitia QED. Uh, we talked about you know, flaritons and regimes of strong coupling, why you do that. And now we've ended up in actually talking about cavity control of uh, various types of condensed matter and its uh, similarities and differences with uh, ultra fast control. So um, I want to just, you know, in the next uh, two minutes or so, uh, leave you with, with some some thoughts around this. Uh, this is uh, um, an area where um, I think there's 
a lot to to um, be done is the you know cavity engineering of uh, uh, 2D materials. I think controlling these platons. You thought you can think about controlling various types of uh, electron phonon coupling. We talk about cavity control of uh, things that could then give you uh, control of, of the uh, superconduct superconducting condensate. It's not the only type of condensate that of interest. Uh, there, are, there are exciton condensates, there are you know, other kinds of things you could control with the, the cavity. Uh, some of the work we're also doing is in cavity control of, of uh, topology. We've worked in topological materials, particularly these vile semi-metals. I absolutely would not have been able to jam that into the talk here today, uh, but I, I hope there will be an opportunity to, to discuss that in future. Uh, finally, I think this idea of going uh, via the phonon uh, you know, we're, we're uh, just now seeing the, the first big results. And I think this is a great opportunity for theory to uh, develop uh, new methods in, in phonon-driven civil conductivity, phonon-driven uh, for electricity, uh, as well as uh, access to the magnetic order via uh, uh, vibrational uh, excitations. And, and of course, you know, if you could also use the phonon then to break various uh, topological symmetries. So uh, with that, I will uh, thank you for your uh, attention and for the time and uh, happy to take any questions that can come up during uh, the last hour or so.